Well, good evening, everyone, and happy Sabbath. I know it's not Sabbath here yet, but uh, it's going to be Sabbath in a few hours. And uh, But before we begin our study here on A.T. Jones, Third Angel's Message number seven, uh, can you join me in a word of prayer? <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for all that you do. Uh, we're grateful for the trials, uh, for the experiences that you bring us through to teach us about ourselves. And Lord, we need you every moment. We know, Lord, that um, we are feeble. That we need your strength. That we, without you, have no ability to discern what is true. And so we invite your presence here as we open your word together, that you can speak to us, that the same spirit that inspired uh, the prophets who wrote the scriptures can help us to interpret them and understand them. We're thankful, Lord, for your servant, A.T. Jones, from the past, that you had chosen to, to give a message to Adventism that is relevant to our present situation today. And so we ask that as we read his study of the scriptures, that you can help us to see his points and uh, to discern uh, the truth and recognize anything that may be error. Be with each person who is studying these things. Help us in our day-to-day -day struggle. Help us in our trials and help us to have the peace in knowing you and understanding and knowing your forgiveness and, and your desire for us to be united with each other and to be united with you. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good evening, everyone. So here we're looking at uh, A.T. Jones, 1895 General Conference Bulletin, and he has moved through, uh, beginning in this series, talking about what was happening currently with uh, uh, the papacy and the Protestants. And, and then he's talking about, really, the church itself. How do we relate to politics? Um, and the basic idea, of course, we know is that uh, we need the gospel. Now, he uses this idea of an ambassador because we are from God's kingdom. We're ambassadors um, to this world. And so we, we recognize that we are, are not to be involved in politics to change the world. But we do expect of the governments to act consistently. And there's, there's a reason for all of these things that he's presenting in these studies. So uh, we're going to look at this one here, which he first presented February 8th, uh, 1895, quite a while ago. So Jones begins. The lesson tonight will be directly connected with the lesson that closed on page 33 of the bulletin. That is the close of the second lesson the one on the position and aims of the papacy, and that you may get the collect connection clearly, I will read a few lines from the last of it, taking again the sentence that was quoted from the letter from Rome, that what we do know is that a world is in its death agony, that we are entering upon the night which must inevitably precede the dawn, and that in preparation for this agony of death of the world, the papacy is casting off the old, and I don't know how to, that how you say that word, slough or slough or sloth. Anybody know? How do you spell it? S l o u g h. How would you pronounce that word? Anybody know? I'm just going to look it up. I'd like to know how words are pronounced. I've heard it pronounced sloth and slough. Yeah, yeah, I know. I've 
Yeah, it's just these, it's pronounced slew. Okay. Okay. Um, some people pronounce it as slap. That's actually the British pronunciation. And you almost also may hear the word pronounced as slough. So with this pronunciation, slough has a different meaning, though. So I don't know. Uh, maybe it is slough. Casting off. I think it is. I think it'd be slough. What's that? Um, I, I'm interested in how that particular word sounds like slew as like you know he slew his old bad habits uh of death of yeah it's world. not really not not related no I th okay. yeah, this would be more like um a body oh, oh wait tapestry is casting off i'm sorry i didn't see water. that yeah beginning. so this is this is slough i think is the way you pronounce this so if it's if it's referring to casting off something it'd be slough Anyway, casting off the old slough, putting on a new form in every conceivable way in order to fulfill her mission in these times that are to come, as was read. Um, so here was read the page 33 from the co quotation. What do we know is that a world is in its death agony to the end of that lesson. So I don't know if we need to read that or not. <clears throat> so they're not going to uh, put it in there. So he's going to read from page 33, the quotation, what do we know? What we do know is, is that the world is in its death agony. And so he reads that to the end of that lesson. So, so now we will study that a little while in the scriptures. We will study that a little while in the scriptures. And these scriptures, like all others that we are quoting and studying here, are scriptures with which we are all perfectly familiar. Scripture, which all have often quoted, and of which we expect the fulfillment. And the first one is Revelation 13, verse 8. Now, of course, 813, Daniel. 813 is Fibonacci, so this is that as well. All that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. That shows that the papacy is to have control of this whole world and all that is in it and of everybody that is in it, except only those whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb. Those who belong to the kingdom of God and are separated from this world. So that, as an actual fact, the papacy does, um, that scripture so shows it too, have possession in the times when these things shall culminate of all those of this world, because Christ's disciples are not of this world. There stands the word, not that God wants it so, but it will be so in spite of all that he wants to the contrary, that all whose names are not in the book of life and retained there will worship the beast. They will do it. It matters not what they have their minds made up to do or not to do. That thing they will do. They cannot help doing it because not having their names in the book of life of the Lamb, they will be of this world entirely and therefore will be of the papacy entirely. Because whatsoever is of this world is of the papacy in the times in which we live. This shows that the power of the world is brought once more into her hand. Now, a verse in the seventh chapter of Daniel, this power will be used by her the only purpose for which she ever used any power in the world or for which she ever shall use it to compel all to do her bidding. All that she ever used any power for was to force upon everybody her dictates. All that she wants with power now is to do that. And everything that she is doing anywhere in the, on the earth is devoted to that one point of getting back her power over the world. The evidences of this that have been given in the lesson we have already had are before all, and I need not cite any of these. I beheld the same horn, made war with the saints, and prevailed against them until the ancients of days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High, and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. 
That is at the coming of Christ, of course. So that when it is written that all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, it is also written of the same of the same time that this power which she shall have gained and is now gaining over the world and in the world is used for the purpose of compelling all to do her bidding, to compel all to worship the beast and those who will not do that she makes war against till the day that they enter into the kingdom of glory at the coming of the Lord. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me saying, come unto me, or say, to, saying unto me, come hither. I will, show, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. Now, before reading the second verse, I wish to call a little more attention to the first verse. <clears throat> the angel that reveals this judgment and explains it and the time in which it comes is one of the angels that has the seven last plagues to be poured out. This shows that the revelation of this judgment is in the time immediately preceding the plagues. For it is one of the angels to whom was given one of the vials of the plagues to be poured out. So that when the time comes that the plagues are imminent and are, as it were, hanging over the world, then this chapter will be understood. Then it will shine forth by the revelation of Jesus Christ, the revelation of the angel which he, he sends. So we need to examine this point a little more closely, what Jones is trying to say. Um, so I need to uh, I'm gonna look at this scripture here, because this isn't some incidental thing that we can just pass by. This is one of the things that, uh, that actually helps us understand what we've been studying for the last year and a half. So he's talking here about which verses. This is going to be chapter. In Revelation. What chapter? Anybody paying attention? Uh, I'm sorry. I was slightly distracted. What did you say? Yeah. Okay, so what chapter is he referring to? And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me saying, come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. So what verse is that? Revelation 17. That's first verse. Yeah. So this is obviously relevant to this movement at the present time, right? Yeah, so so here we're studying A.T. Jones' message on righteousness by faith, and he's looked at um, uh, chapter 13, verse 8 in Revelation, and now he's going to look at Revelation 17. So this is similar to our studies that we did on the presidents of the United States. We're looking at some of this, these same passages. Now, and Jones has said some things about this passage which we need to understand, right? And to understand what he's saying, whether it's correct or whether it's not correct. Um, it's important to understand what he's saying. Now he says, um, and he notes that this is one of the seven angels which had the seven vials that's going to, to do this. Now the seven last plagues are mentioned in chapter 16, right? So this is where we have the seven last plagues. Talks about the seven last plagues when they're going to... Now, the seven last plagues um, um, they're obviously still future, right? So we they're, they're not a prophecy like the, the other, like the seven churches or the seven trumpets or the seven seals uh, that are in the past. These are some, this is a group of seven that's in the future still. So the question is, why do they have, why does God have chapter 16 before chapter 17?
not not obviously 7 16 is always going to precede 17 but the content in chapter 16 the plagues why are the plagues mentioned here prior to chapter 17 cuz chapter 7 do you understand the question that i'm asking sort of okay Because with Revelation, we we often don't understand the structure of this book. We don't understand the order because it's not written chronologically. That is, it's not starting at the beginning and showing events in the future as they're going to happen chronologically. It uses this repeat and enlarge, right? It's, it's a it's a basically a principle used throughout the scriptures. So you're going to have in 15, you're going to have uh, this story about the Song of Moses and the Lamb. Um, and it's going to talk, talk about this. Um, I saw, as it were, the sea of glass mingled with fire and then that it gotten the victory over the beast. So you're going to see the end and the, over the image and over the mark of his, uh, over the, his mark and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass having the harps of God. Right. And of course, that's a continuation of chapter 14. They sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. So we call it the song of Moses and the Lamb. And, and it, at the end of this, um, Revelation 15, verse 8, And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. Right. So it's going to mention these angels. So this is a section. Right. Chapter 15. Right. And chapter 16, they're, they're really part, part of the same. Story, right. The same section here. And and that's going to go all the way up to this seventh plague. And um, then when we get to chapter 17, now it's going to show us the judgment of the great whore, right? And in this section, um, it's, it's going to talk about something that we then see continuing in chapter 18. So this is going to be the fall of spiritual Babylon, right? So that Revelation 18 now, Revelation 18, when does Revelation 18 begin? Where do we place that in history? Where does Ellen White place it? She places it at the Sunday Law, right? Um, I'm sorry, yes. Yeah, so we have here... The Sunday law, this is Revelation 18. Revelation 17 and 16, uh, well, 17. So 17 is talking about something which the angels that have the seven last plagues, one of the angels, which have the seven vials, right? So these vials that are poured out, um, is going to ask him to come and see the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, and then, but previous to that is going to be the seven last plagues. And do the seven last plagues come before the Sunday law? We know that they don't. They come after, right? They come after the close of probation. So what is the reason for the way that Revelation is written? This is a simple question. Part of this structure is what we would call chiastic. So in, in Hebrew, you know, Bible, we have things like parallels. We have repeats and enlarge, which are a type of parallel. So why do we have a chiasm? What does a chiasm do?
think about Christ chiasm. What what is the what's the point of a chiasm? Um so a chiasm has a beginning and an end and a middle, right? Yes. So what's the most it is kind of a, a bad question, but what's the most important part of a chiasm? The middle. Heidi says the middle. Now, it's 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 true, but it's also not true. I mean, it's true in that the middle of a chiasm is the key that unlocks the meaning of the chiasm, but it's not necessarily what the chiasm is about, but is it's the key. Yeah, right. we figured that one out. Right. right. So this was a, a thing that was brought up back in 2019 at the yeah. School of Prophets. Um, I believe it was Ra Bronwyn who took, there was this discussion with Jeff and Bronwyn about uh, the chiasms. Um, so we know that the center of the chiasm is extremely important, but it's it's not the whole story but it is a key that helps us to understand the meaning of the chiasm. So obviously the cross of Christ, the purpose is this is a transition from uh, literal Israel to spiritual Israel. Um, and of course, from earthly to heavenly. Um, <clears throat> but we know that, that whole structure altogether is important. There's, there's a whole package or meaning. But without the cross of Christ, we wouldn't have the meaning of the chiasm. You need the center of the chiasm. So, so when I say this is written in a chiasm, uh, I wouldn't say that you know all revelation is completely just one chiasm. But definitely we have a chiasm from this point or from some point here because... Um, you know, we're going to have the 144,000 mentioned in Revelation 7. And, and then you're going to have this, uh, this seventh seal, right, being opened. And, or, or these seals, right, you're going to have the seals, right? So um, these are, are the seven seals. And then you're going to have the trumpets, right? So you have you have the churches, the seals, and then the trumpets. So now you're going to have these trumpets, and all of these lead up to um, Revelation 10, right? You're going to have this mighty angel come down from heaven. This is going to bring you up to Millerite history, right? The two witnesses, you're going to have the French Revolution. And, and even this whole history, Revelation 12, this is going to bring you to 1798, right? This is going to give you the time of the papacy, 1260 days, which is years. And then Revelation 13 brings us up to the Sunday law, right? And then at the, yes, end, that's and it. At the, at the end of chapter 13, uh, you know, we're going to have this whole whole thing about um you know the mark of the beast right so revelation 13 18 so you have that there and then you're going to have uh, the 144,000 so when you get to this the question is at what point where is this this chiasm so how would we understand this well we're going to see that this is millerite history right so everything brings us up to Millerite history. The messages of the three angels, this is Millerite history. Um, and, then, and then it's going to bring us the harvest of the earth, right? So it's going to bring us up to the Day of Atonement, the temple, right? Um, and, uh, and then you're going to have the seven last plagues, right? So the seven last plagues, right, this, uh, I'm trying to hard, it's, there's so much detail here, but when we look at this section, this section is going to, in a sense, um, go from that point backwards, right? It's a mirror. Does that make sense to people? So it's it's now going to go backwards to the Sunday Law in chapter 18. 
I never really thought of it quite like that. Yeah. So, so you can think chapter 13 is, is, has the Sunday law, right? It's going to go to the 144,000. So it's, it's going to, it's, it's going to talk about the Sunday law, but it's going to start in Millerite history with this, this message of the three angels' messages. And then it's going to have the seven last plagues, right? Well, that's because if you look at Millerite history, Millerite history is a type of the Sunday law. So these, Revelation 14 is a type of Revelation 18 but it's going to work its way back from there. So when you get to Revelation 18, you get the Sunday law again. So, so you would go backwards from Revelation 18 to 17 to 16 to 15 to 14, and then to 13. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's, it's beginning to um, make sense. Yeah, so it's like a mirror. But it's, it's a mirror that, if we look at the center, the center is actually telling us about the end. Right? That is, it's talking about the Sunday law that's in Revelation 18. Now, Revelation 17, of course, is addressing this as well. Now, the point that Jones makes, though, is, is rather interesting. So he says, before reading the second verse, so I'm just going to read this over. I won't switch the screen. I wish to call a little more attention to the first verse. The angel that reveals this judgment and explains it and the time in which it comes is one of the angels that has the seven last plagues to be poured out. So one of the things that we have trouble with Revelation 17 is people talk about when it is. So when is John seen? And if John is seen 1798, you know, the question is, is that where John is? Is he in 1798 or is he in the time that he was living? Is he in the first century AD? Or some people will put him in the future. So just to read this again. He says, the angel that reveals this judgment and explains it and the time in which it comes so that's the time in which it comes is one of the angels that had the seven last plagues to be poured out. So he's saying that this judgment is in the time of the seven last plagues. And that's where the angel reveals this judgment and explains it in that time. So what is Jones saying then? He's saying that the angel is explaining this. at the time of the seven last plagues. But the seven last plagues is still future. Now we have taken that this is in 1798. That's traditionally way where we would look at, at this, that it's in 1798. So but he says, this shows that the revelation of this judgment is in the time immediately preceding the it is one of the angels to whom was given one of the vials of the plagues to be poured out. So what does he mean by that? Uh, the revelation of this judgment is in the time immediately preceding the plagues. So I'm sorry, I'm having a problem hearing what you're saying immediately preceding the what? Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll let you see this here. This shows that the revelation of this judgment, so he's saying that this judgment is being revealed, is in the time immediately preceding the plagues. So, so Jones is placing the revelation of the judgment as something that's still future. That is, it's the time immediately preceding the plagues. For it is one of the angels to whom was given one of the vials of the plagues to be poured out. So since it's an angel who has a vial, one of the vials, it's being revealed in that time. That is, that's he's he's saying that because this is happening yep. with an, an angel that I has agree. a vial. It makes sense. So that when the time comes, 
that the plagues are imminent and are, as it were, hanging over the world, then this chapter will be understood. Um, that would be like right now. <laughs> well, well, not, is, that, not really. is that what you're saying? It's current? No, it's, it's still future. Okay. Because the plagues are not imminent. Oh, he said, okay. then it will shine forth by the revelation of Jesus Christ, the revel revelation of the angel which he sends. So this is kind of interesting because this is this is Revelation chapter 17. And he's saying that the time when this will be understood is when the plagues are imminent because it's one of the angels pouring out the plagues that shows it. This is something that we wouldn't normally say. Right. We try to place where is John? Where is he? You know. Um, you know, five, five are fallen. One is and one is not yet to climb. So what's the context? Well, we would put him at 1798. Right. That's, that was in, good. Yeah. And the pioneers put him in the first century A.D. Because they're saying that when the angel is explaining it, the angel, he sees a vision in the future. But when the angel is explaining it to him, it's, he's explaining it from his context. And this can be shown in other places. So this is one of the things that um, in the 391 words that was not understood, um, whether it was Jeff who wrote those 391 words, which I think it could only be him, but it was not understood what the context was of why we were saying we need to look at the pioneer's understanding. And, and, and what we need to recognize is what J Jones has just said, that there, there's actually three different ways we can look at the time. We can look at it as from the time of the prophet himself, when the angel is explaining it, that would be from the prophet's perspective. But that doesn't discount the idea that this is also from the perspective of 1798, that we can make the application we have of the seven heads as being Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, Rome, Pagan, Rome, Papal, the United States, the UN, and then the papacy, right? The head that's, it doesn't discount that. That sounds like what we had determined. Right, but we know that what the pioneer said about it is also correct. Right. And what and what Jones is saying here is also correct. These are not either or, or you pick and choose which one. That there is an understanding. So we, so we can look at the point of this. John receives the vision. He's given an explanation from his time perspective. Right? Five or fallen one is. So we know that the one is, is imperial Rome. Right. So this would be how we would understand this vision. This is how the pioneers understood it. We consider that local time. Considered what? Local time. OK, local time. That's a good way of looking at it. So we have this local time explanation and you can't discount that explanation. And then we have. Our understanding. So our understanding has been this is 1798. Well, there is an application that we can make of that. It doesn't discount the, the other application that the pioneers made. But Jones is making another one. So, so we can say the one is when the vision is first given, this local time. And then we can have this context of the vision itself. But Jones is also showing us that this, in a sense, is a third time, time reference. So if we call the first one local time, um, which I think is, is a good way to describe it, um, we have a future time. That is, it's a time prophecy about the future, but it hasn't happened yet. Right. That is in your you're in the midst of this fulfillment. Right. Because when we say five are fallen. 
we're not talking John's local time. We're talking the time of the end time. Right? I don't know what we would call it. Their local time. Hmm. There must be some other way we could describe it. But I that, know you don't like to repeat, but symbols have two more than one uh, meaning sometimes. Yeah. But then when, what Jones is talking about is it's it not just being understood because he says then it will shine forth by the revelation of jesus christ the revelation of the angel which he sends so this is its fulfillment so the other one's not its fulfillment we could say there's the local time of the prophecy there is um maybe we could say even a a it, we're in the midst of that prophecy. But here, this is when this prophecy is fulfilled. Because it's the shining forth by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, when we look at the messages, the first, second, and third angel's messages, we know that the uh, righteousness by faith is the third angel's message in verity, or the other way around, I can never remember. But the idea is that righteousness by faith is all of the messages but but the shining forth of the revelation of Jesus Christ is under the third angel, right? So so I, I think this is an important point. Like it's not necessarily completely um, like what we discussed. We wouldn't necessarily need to understand this paragraph to know what jones is saying but in the context of what we're doing right now we need to recognize that when you pass over the ground of fulfilled prophecy then you will see the significance of the events that you are passing through it's one thing to talk about a prophecy that talks about the future and there's different applications that you could make of revelation 17 so when we made an application of revelation 17 that the one that is, is talking about 1798, that's talking about the United States. You know, five are fallen, papacies, one is the US, but the pioneers looked at the one is, is imperial Rome, when they had an emperor, that's in the first century. So forms of Roman government, you know, we said, well, you have to choose one or the other, right? That's the way that people would look at it. You know, the pioneers are wrong. You know, our view is right. Or the pioneers were right. That other view is wrong. But can we see that they're both right? And that Jones is also correct. It looks like it to me. Okay. Now, as far as when, from Jones' point of view, <laughs> to his local time, I mean, definitely he thinks that that he's in the time of the Sunday law. And so he believes that, that we could understand this chapter because we're actually in that history. And, and we would say the same thing about our time, right? I'm sorry, I couldn't find the button, yes. Yeah, so, so in a sense, immediately proceeding, I mean, that's sort of a, um, in the context of biblical time, uh, immediate can be quite a number of decades, <laughs> right? Yeah, that's what we've determined. So, and I would say that uh, since Revelation um, in 14, in a sense, you are in that history of the Millerite history, right? The three angels messages. But we are also in the time of the three angels messages in a repeat of history. So I don't think that we should um, discount what Jones is saying, because if you took the position that this movement has, you would have to discount what Jones is saying on this, on this verse. Okay, so, so hopefully that's helpful to, to understand. I just thought it was an important point that we need uh, to look at. Now he says, this being one of the angels having the vials, he does not say, come here and I will show thee the woman, he does not say, come here and I will show thee the great whore. 
but come hither, I will show thee the judgment of the great whore. Then again, as it is one of the seven angels that have the seven last plagues who reveals this, that shows that the revelation will be in the time when the plagues are just hanging over the world and are ready to fall. So just before the close of probation. And as the revelation is the judgment of her and not the revelation of herself, that shows that the revelation and this chapter which describes it and the times which are connected with it, that there and then will be the time of the revelation of these things that the angel has to tell. Now, I'm not starting on a study of the 17th chapter of Revelation or undertaking to explain that chapter. I'm reading this simply to get the time when the thing is to be. And now for the second verse. The judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth have made, been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So we know that this is uh, the time in which is just we're on the edge of this time. I mean, in a sense, it's already happening, right? Um, when? When does this angel appear? Just before the judgment of her falls. Who is he? One of the seven that have the plague. So that, by this double count, this is plainly just before the judgment of her. When is it then that the kings of the earth are referred to in this verse? At the same time, assuredly. At that time, what will be the condition of the kings of the earth? Not some of them, but them as respects this great harlot. Oh, that they have all held illicit connection with her. And the inhabitants of the earth at that time have all been made drunk by her. Then that tells the same thing that the other verse does. That all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life. Well, after the angel goes on describing this judgment of her, or rather the events that immediately precede the judgment, then another angel joins, Revelation 18.1. After these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations. How many of them? All. When? In this time when one of the seven angels with the seven plagues appears and tells of the judgment of Babylon. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth are all waxed rich, are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven. Do not forget then, it is a voice from heaven saying it, saying, come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues, for her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. What has she remembered her iniquities for? What does that mean, that God hath remembered her iniquities? Back in Egypt, it was said of the Lord, I have remembered my covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I have remembered the promises um, I made to your fathers. I will deliver you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments. Exodus 6, verse 5 and 6. When he remembered that the thing was done, that had been promised formerly. God hath remembered her iniquities. And this shows that this remembrance of her iniquities means the visiting of the judgment upon her iniquities, right? So it's just remembering is not that he forgot, but he's coming back to this, to this judgment that he had said was going to happen. Reward her even as she rewarded you and double unto her double according to her works. In the cup which she hath filled, fill to her double. How much hath she glorified herself and lived deliciously? So much torment, so much, so much torment and sorrow give her, 
For as much as she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously, so much torment and sorrow give her. So you're going to give her the correct measure for how much she has glorified herself and lived deliciously. That, that same amount is how much you're going to give of tor torment and sorrow. For she saith in her heart, I sit a queen and am no widow and shall see no sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine. And she shall be utterly burned with fire. For strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. Um, this is still the description which the angel gave when he said, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her. When they shall see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, thy great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. Thus, when Babylon triumphs, she is destroyed in one hour, the shortest period of time that is measured in the Bible, aside from the resur resurrection moment, which is the twinkling of an eye. So that when this judgment does fall, it falls in a way, and before it falls, it falls in that way, and before it falls, these warnings are given. And God gives us signs by which we may know and mark the way up to the time when that is the thing, and the one thing that comes next. Now, before our eyes in the daily papers, on YouTube, Facebook, um, social media, etc., in the situation, even as we have examined it in the previous lessons, the papacy is now carrying on the very movement that is here marked out and is succeeding at every step. In former lessons, we have merely touched evidences or evidence as relates to the, to the United States. Brother Robinson gave me a copy of The Present Truth a day or two ago, and there on the first page, are quotations from Catholic papers of London touching the nations of Europe that are counted as not being exactly Catholic and how that these are falling more and more and one by one back into the hands of the papacy. In the American Sentinel two or three weeks ago, you have the evidence taken from the Catholic papers as to Germany and Switzerland. The Catholic Church holds the balance of power in Germany. A Catholic for Chancellor, of the German Empire and the Catholic Church party in the Reichstag holding the balance of power so that the government cannot do anything it wants to without their will and permission. And they hold for the repeal of all the laws that have been enacted against the papacy or anything or else nothing goes. And they are getting that what they want as the days go by. So we can definitely see this in our day. Now, when we look at, because um, we know there are three powers, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. So we have the beast being the papacy, the false prophet, the United States, the dragon, uh, the globalist, the UN, spiritualism. Um, and when we look at, um, let's say something like the glo globalists, are they doing the will of the papacy? It's a trick question. Um, probably not at this moment. Okay. They'll morph into, they'll morph into that. Okay. So they are doing the, the will of the papacy, but they just don't realize they are. Uh, that's right. what my, I would say. Yeah. yeah. That is, the papacy has so... Um, Manipulate. Ingrained. Well, it, it's what? It's ingrained in thought. It's a it's it's a way of thinking. Uh, right. It, it's 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 something that you don't realize. It's it's ingrained, and you don't even realize it. Yeah, yeah. So the papacy is seeking um, to control the world, but it does it through a deceit through sleight of hand. It, it it controls the nations, not by direct control, 
Um, this may be a bad example, but because <laughs> it's kind of the opposite example. But when I was raising my kids, the one thing is, if I didn't want them to do something, um, instead of just you know telling them to stop doing it, I would give them something else to do that they liked better. Now, it's I'm not really manipulating them in a bad way, but in in a good way. But you can you can sort of create a climate or an idea or a philosophy or a principle or whatever you want to call it that can actuate the world in in a way that um, is going to benefit the papacy in the long run. So the papacy's idea of economics, for instance, is is socialistic. The papacy believes in socialism. Yet the papacy was opposed uh, to the USSR. Why is that? Why did why so did the I papacy didn't quite understand that? Okay, well because you you would think well they they like communism they like socialism, and here we have the USSR this powerful nation that's that is basically working out some of their economic beliefs. And, and so the yeah, papacy... It, was, it, it, was, it wouldn't be because, because uh, the, the papacy didn't have control of the... Uh, yeah, well, they don't necessarily even need control because as long as their will is being done... But see, there. so you have to think that the papacy thinks... It plays the what we call the uh, the long con, right? That is, it it it's not thinking short term. So the papacy has been planning these things for centuries, and what it wants is control of the world. So the papacy is going to unite with the United States, who is an enemy of the Soviet Union. Now, the Soviet Union is much more in line with the papacy than the United States is. So why wouldn't just the papacy join with the Soviet Union? Which was more powerful, the United States or the Soviet Union? I'd say the United States was. Yeah. So... The papacy would be foolish to join with the Soviet Union. It's going to join with the United States. Because the United States, if it's joined with the United States, then it's its power that's being exercised, not really the American power. It, it, it makes the United States its military. And the, it's, it's the most powerful military. So the Catholic Church is going to join with the most powerful state that it can, right? So they're clasping hands. Yes. Now, it's going to be the United States that does this, right? So it doesn't say the Catholic Church reaches across to the United to the to the Protestant world or to the US, and it doesn't say that the, you know, the Catholic Church then reaches its hands across to uh the the gulf to uh the dragon right it, it's the united states that actually does this reaching and grasping because it's apostate protestantism it's this one that has horns like a lamb but spake as a dragon but you can see how the catholic church operates it's it's thinking about its long-term goals if it was a short-term thinker or if it was sincere and honest, it would just join with the power that actually more aligns with its values. Right? But you can see how it's working in the United States and all of these different countries seeking to have the power of the state. So, so was that a under, question? No, it wasn't a question. We can see how it's working. So, um, so here in this history, the Catholic Church holds the balance of power in Germany, right? It, it, it's seeking power of the state. And it doesn't matter what state it is. 
it's going to have its power. So, so that the government cannot do anything it wants to without their will and permission. And they hold for the repeal of all the laws that have been enacted against the papacy or anything, or, or else nothing goes. They're getting what they want as the days go by. So when we look at something like the World Economic Forum now, so the United States is this great power overthrew the Soviet Union, but the Catholic Church didn't really need the Soviet Union overthrown, at least the principles, the economics of it. It just needed, it needed this conflict so that it could gain more power. So it used this conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union so that it could gain power in the United States. Right? Because the United States was Protestant. It didn't want to have anything to do with the Catholic Church. But because they had a common enemy, well, really, the USSR wasn't really the enemy of the papacy. Not, not really. They, went in, they, they formed an agreement, uh, an unlawful marriage. Right. Now, we could say, well, atheism, that's obviously the enemy of the papacy. But the papacy doesn't really care about that. It only cares about power. Right? They don't really care what you believe. They just That's want what it help. seems. Their beliefs are just to help exercise power. You just want to be everything to everybody. Yes. Right. Well, because they want to control everyone. <laughs> So, so anyway, we, we can see how this is happening. It's, it's about the papacy having control. Switzerland has a Catholic for a president, and of him, the London universe says that he is as papal as a Swiss guard. It is not strange, therefore, that the experiences which we have heard from brethren in Switzerland should be manifesting themselves against the truth of God and against the Lord. The other day, I saw a German paper in which the editor and proprietor spoke of a trip he had taken through through Europe, and passing through Holland, he saw the parade of Catholics in celebrating the recovery of Holland to the Catholic Church. In England, for the papacy to get control, only one thing remains of all the things that were done in making England a Protestant country and establishing the succession of sovereigns. All that remains is just that one requirement, that the sovereign shall be a Protestant the oath to sustain the Protestant succession is gone. And the one remaining point that requires a Protestant succession has become so weakened that the papacy herself is in expectation that even this will soon be modified, so modified that it may be a, a moment set aside and she have control at one, once more. About a year ago, the Pope, in receiving the bands of pilgrims from England and giving them his blessing, said to them, that there were many signs in favor of England's once more returning to the church. Now, of course, we, we've seen this develop. I mean, this is a long time ago, right? Um, 1895. So we're looking at something that's uh, 130 years ago, right? Almost. And uh, so, but we, we've seen this development. You can see what has happened with the Church of England and, and, and presently what's happening with these churches, this, these divisions that existed within the Catholic Church uh, through ecumenism has, has really united um, the Christian world, and especially at the top in an organizational structure. So many people don't realize how much uh, the various churches are sub being submissive to the papacy. We can see that in something like spiritual formation. I mean, this is really a papal idea that Protestants all must, if you're going to be an ordained minister, have to go through a course of, right? So, and, and we saw this happening way back in, in the 1800s um, with the Oxford movement. And um, so this, and this romanticizing of the papacy that was occurring. Um, of Catholicism. So this has been going on for a long time, but in the in the scheme of things, it's actually been fairly rapid. <clears throat> so Jones goes on, these are simply, well, they are more than signs of what is going on. They are the actual facts in the proceedings themselves of what is going on. 
we cannot count them as signs as they are the thing itself. So they're not just types, they're the actual thing, is what he's saying. Now, of course, we can see that that they are signs, but and it is the actual thing, but the thing is taking a little bit longer than he thought it would. In these extracts from the Catholic papers that were printed in the present truth, the United States was mentioned among the countries where the papacy is having its greatest success. And directly in the line of these evidences that we have presented already in the lessons is the fact that the United States is to be used, as the Pope says, in the molding in the molding all the other nations, must be in molding all the other nations, and that this country is to shape the destiny of the other nations, and the destiny of the other nations is always intended to be simply the return of the world to the papacy and to do her will and to promote her interests in the earth. Now, when you take this paragraph, it doesn't seem that odd to us now, but can you see how odd this would be what Jones is saying, in 1895. How people would not, you know, how it would be hard for people to accept what he's saying. Yeah, because the paper had just been uh, brought down in 1798. Yeah, and also the United States is extremely anti-Catholic. Yeah, they used yes. to burn down uh, Catholic churches, I think. That's one of the reasons this country was made was because of that attitude the Catholics okay. had. So, so here you have somebody in 1895. Of course, he has the Bible and the spirit of prophecy to support him. But that the United States is to be used, as the Pope says, in molding all the other nations and that this country is to shape the destiny of the other nations. Now, even then, when we think about the fact that this is the Catholic, that the United States is anti-Catholic, it's Protestant. But also, does the United States have that power at that time? Because we think about here, you know, in 1989, the United States, after those two world wars, is really the most powerful nation in the world. This is not true in 1895. Right? Um, I, I don't think that, right. I mean, I think that statement is correct. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's the powers of Europe that still are, those are the powers of the world. Those are the world powers. The United States is just this young yes. part of the country that is, um, you We're know. the experiment, bro. Yeah. Yeah. So the United States was an experiment and, and a very successful one based upon the principles of Protestantism. So then we stand in the presence of a long way forward too in the presence of the events that are bringing the fulfillment of these prophecies to the point when all nations need to be actually joined once more to her. And when she shall have succeeded in all this movement that is being carried on, when these things are fulfilled, then her judgment falls. When that point is reached, when that time comes in which she stands at the place where she can congratulate herself that all these nations are joined to her once more, and she has lifted herself to the supremacy out of the turmoils and the agonies, the anarchy and the violence of every kind to the supremacy as she did once before. When this is fulfilled, that is the last thing that we shall see before her judgment falls. Pretty profound um, couple of paragraphs there. A few years ago, we preached the coming of the Lord as we do yet. We preached everywhere the coming of the Lord, the soon coming of the Lord, even in the generation that is upon the earth, and that generation a long way forward uh, a lot in its life. May Yet, I make a comparison? Yeah. Um, go back just a bit and to the, the uh, her judgment falls. Yeah. Right before the judgment falls, it says a few years ago we preached the coming of the Lord. Blah blah blah. Okay, but yeah. up in there, um, I would like to sh uh, give you an example, um, a worldly example of how fast it can happen. Has anybody been tracking the uh, progress on uh, the Bud Light people and the turmoil that's gone on? They went from a very popular brand to can't give it away. 
to will almost pay you money to buy it. Uh, and um, and it seems as though it might be wrecking the parent company, Anheuser Busch. Uh, it, and it, it's happened literally overnight. Yeah. Yeah, things can things can happen pretty quickly in the world. Um, so that's how it can happen. The la the final events will be rapid ones, and so revolution that is occurring, civil war in the United States. I mean, it will happen very quickly. It will escalate extremely quickly. And exactly right. how, in a way, right. everything right. happens fast. Yeah. Okay, so we preached everywhere the coming. We're just of, watching. Yeah, the soon coming of the Lord, even in the generation that is upon the earth, and that generation a long way forward in its life. Yet at the same time, we told all the people to whom we preached that the Lord was coming, that He could not come until the United States government had recognized the Christian religion and had set up Sunday instead of the Sabbath. We told them, in other words that he could not come until this government had made the image of the beast. Then, after having told them that the Lord is coming and coming soon, and that the generation is far spent in which he will come, and we had to tell them that this thing had to come before he could come, and then we turned to point out to them the steps that were taken and the progress that had been made toward the recognition of religion in the United States and the setting up of Sunday instead of the Sabbath. These things we told them were the signs by which they might mark the way up to that thing that should be done. And as soon as it should be done, then we would know the coming of the Lord was to be looked forward as to look forward to as never before. Now that has been done. We cannot in truth tell the people that the United States is going to recognize the Christian religion. We cannot tell the people anymore that the United States government is going to put away the Sabbath of the Lord from the fourth commandment and put Sunday in its place. No man can do that and speak truly. Everyone that speaks the truth on that has to say that that has been done and point the people simply to the official record in the proceedings of the government that shows it, and there it stands. Therefore, as this is truly so, this text applies as never before. Now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. Now, we pointed this out in the 1893 General Conference, um, General Conference Bulletin. The Jones was saying, we're now in Revelation 18. We're, we're at the time of the Sunday law. And, and he's still saying this same thing, right? He's saying, here we are. Christ is coming soon. Now, we know, of course, that didn't happen. And, and so he's talking about, well, we're in this time. But he's actually in a typical time. And the same is true of this movement presently. We are in a typical time. That is, this movement typifies something that's going to happen. And we saw that with Parminder and his group in November 9th, 2019. That, and prior to that, how they turned suddenly to this completely contrary message to the gospel that they took with them the vast majority of this movement almost literally overnight almost <laughs> yeah it, it happened very very quickly so and quick I, I couldn't keep up with it <laughs> yeah At first was that so quick yeah so but we can see that this is typical of events that are going to happen in this world and we don't fully understand them yet and i would say with jones when, when he's talking about the angel of Revelation 17, that we're going to understand it when it happens. Um, I, I think that's a truism, that prophecy is always understood as it's being fulfilled. We, we have an idea about it, but we don't have the details. We don't know how it's going to unfold exactly. <clears throat> We also told people, uh, told the people that when that thing should succeed, the papacy would rise and triumph at the expense of the Protestants who were doing that and without their expectations and put herself in the place and would receive strength and influence and power from it to mold the world once more to her hand. 
Well, we cannot say anymore that the papacy is going to do that. The only thing we can now say is she is doing it and point the people now to the facts which show that she is doing it. And that is her one grand scheme for the whole world to be worked through this power, which she already has upon the United States. And of course, that's what this movement has been doing with the fall of the Soviet Union. That was the work that Jeff was doing um, through the 90s, uh, showing basically what Jones is doing, that we're, we're at the Sunday law. The Sunday law is imminent. And, and after 9-11, of course, uh, we understand that, that we're in the time of the Sunday law, in this line, right, in that, that line. Uh, but the success of that scheme, the completion of that plan of hers, the papacies, is simply the fulfillment of this prophecy that we have read, that all the nations would be joined to her, all would be worshiping her, the inhabitants of the earth connected with her, all the world under her hand, all worshiping her, and the power of all the world in her hands to pour out in wrath against those who fear God. The scripture sets forth in prophecy precisely the thing that everyone um, of us sees and cannot help seeing that the papacy is doing. And the very point that the prophecy sets out in the very point at which the papacy aims and toward which she is working and which, when she reaches it, will see the prophecy fulfilled. I sit a queen and am no widow and shall see no sorrow. And when that plan of the papacy is completed and the prophecy and the papacy meet at that point, then says the word in one hour, from that point, her judgment comes. She shall be utterly burned with fire. For strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. So we can see here what, what Jones is talking about is very relevant to this movement at the present time. And it's at the point which those things are fulfilled that, um, that we can see these things, right? So there comes a time when we see these things. But then are we but in the very days when the judgment of, where then are we but in the very days when the judgment of the great whore and the plagues of God are hanging over the world? There is where we certainly stand. Then see this. As at the first, we were obliged to point the people to the signs that marked the coming of the image of the beast. And as we are now beyond that and can cite those things no more. So now we are in the time when event after event simply marks the steps which we are to take in passing to the coming of the Lord. And a good many of those steps are taken and we are beyond them. And in this time, what word has the Lord put there to be given to the world? Come out of her, my people. What for? Why? That ye may be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. The success of this movement of the papacy that is being carried out, or carried on, in its, is its ruin. Her success is her ruin. Her triumph is her destruction in an hour. Then whoever would not be ruined must separate from her, leave her entirely. And whosoever would not see his fellow man endangered and ruined must, in the fear of God and the love of souls, say to them, escape for your life, for ruin is about to fall. Her ruin will be how widespread? How much does it embrace? How much is it un is under her control? How many are worshiping her? How far does her wrath extend? And how many are made drunk with the wine of the wrath of her fornication? All the world. Then when the judgment falls upon her, how widespread will be the judgment worldwide? When the ruin falls, how complete is the ruin? Utterly. It is said that he cometh up, up out of the bottomless pit, and goeth into perdition. Perdition means utter destruction. She goes into utter destruction. Then as certainly as her influence is worldwide, as certainly as all nations are joined to her, and the inhabitants of the earth are drunk with the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and as certainly as that all that dwell upon the earth are worshiping him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb, so certainly all this shows that everyone will fall in the ruin and will be ruined 
by the ruin, whose name is not in the book of life. Then also, as certainly as we stand here, so certainly God has given a message to us in the midst of these events. And that message is to warn the world that it is indeed in its death agony. That out of that death agony, the papacy triumphs. That her triumph is her certain ruin. And that whoever will escape must come out of her. Now, I think we have time to bring a word here that will illustrate this thing so forcibly that all can see it. There was a Babylon of old. God caused the prophet to write out her judgment. In the 50th and 51st chapters of Jeremiah, there is written out in prophecy the judgment of Babylon. I'm not going to read a description of it. All can read it at your leisure because there is a great deal in it for us even now. We will read the last verses of the 51st chapter, beginning with the 59th verse. The word of the Lord, which Jeremiah the prophet commanded Sariah, the son of Neriah, the son of Messiah, when he went with Zedekiah, or on behalf of Zedekiah, the king of Judah, unto Babylon, into Babylon in the fourth year of his reign. And this Sariah was a quiet prince. So Jeremiah wrote in a book all the evil that should come upon Babylon, even all these words that are written against Babylon. And Jeremiah said to Sariah, when thou comest to Babylon and shalt see and shalt read all these words, then thou shalt say, O Lord, thou hast spoken against this place to cut it off that none shall remain in it, neither man nor beast, but that it shall be desolate forever. And it shall be when thou hast made an end of reading this book, that thou shalt bind a stone to it and cast it in the midst of Euphrates. And thou shalt say, Thus shall Babylon sink, and shall not rise from the evil that I will bring upon her, and they shall be weary. Look at Revelation 18.21. In connection with this is the judgment of Babylon, the description of it. A mighty angel took up the stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall this, that great city, Babylon, be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. Is there any correspondence between these two stones? Assuredly, there is. Then that sinking of old Babylon pointed to the sinking of Babylon now. The judgment of Babylon in old time pointed to the judgment of Babylon in this time. So, I mean, this is a very basic principle that we understand from the scriptures that we have spiritual Babylon and we have literal Babylon. So literal Babylon is a type of spiritual Babylon. But of course, Babylon, spiritual Babylon encompasses the entire world, but it has three parts, right? The dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Anyway, now Jones goes on. Now we notice Jeremiah 51, 45. My people go ye out of the midst of her. God's people were in that Babylon. He had a people there. He did not want them to be there when the judgment of Babylon fell and caused her ruin. Therefore, he said, my people, go ye out of the midst of her and deliver ye every man his soul from the fierce anger of the Lord. What is the word now? As the angel is about to cast that mighty stone into the sea and say, thus with violence shall that great city, Babylon, be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. The call is, come out of her, my people that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye received not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. For strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. Reading again in Jeremiah of the old Babylon, and lest your heart faint and ye fear for the rumor that shall be heard in the land, a rumor shall come, both come one year, and after that in another year shall come a rumor and violence in the land, ruler against ruler. The people in Babylon were to have two rumors as the sign for leaving Babylon. Two rumors of what? Two rumors of her fall. Two rumors of her destruction. A rumor was to come one year that the armies of the Medes and the Persians were on their way. But were they to be afraid that the ruin would be then, that the ruin would be then and was everywhere to go as quickly as, as he possibly could? No. He could go if he chose, but the ruin was to be in another year. So when the first rumor uh, was come, then was the preparation to get ready, to go. 
so that when the second rumor should come, then they had to go, or her ruin would be their ruin. According to Media Persian Army, according to the Media Persian Army, accordingly, the Medo Persian Army started from Ecbatana in the spring of AD 539 before Babylon fell. Now, he actually gets this history wrong, but that's not his fault. That's just because we didn't have as much information as we have today. So he's wrong about uh, uh, the year there. But anyway, the year before Babylon fell, because Babylon actually fell in the fall of 539 and went partly on the way and then stopped and stayed until the next spring. When the army started, of course, the first rumor spread rapidly to Babylon. That was the first sign that everybody there could prepare to get away just as soon as they could. They could, in a sense, take their time for the actual going, but they must prepare to be ready at the second rumor, for when the second rumor came, they must go or perish. When the next spring came, and that's going to be actually in 539, uh, the other year, the army started again on the way to Babylon. Then came the second rumor of Babylon's ruin. And the ruin came with the second rumor. And who was so, whoever would escape the ruin had to flee when the rumor came. Now look at modern Babylon and the two rumors of her fall. In 1844, there came the first rumor of the fall of Babylon. Revelation 14, verse 6 to 8. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, etc. So we're all familiar with that. Um, there was a rumor of the fall of Babylon that was the first rumor. Now read Revelation 18, 1 to 4. Um, and I saw another angel come down from heaven, having the great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great has fallen, has fallen. So the second angel's message, right? But it's here under this one, and it says, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people that she be not partakers of her sins, and that she receive not of her plagues. When that second rumor comes, the rumor ceases only with the judgment, which is her ruin. Are we in the time of the second rumor of the fall of, of the second Babylon? Oh, we are. We certainly are. So he's just comparing Millerite history with his history. So he's saying that we're in this second rumor. Um then as certainly as that second rumor of the Medo-Persian army in ancient Babylon meant her certain ruin, as certainly as that is true, so certainly we are in the midst of the second rumor now. And who's, whoever will escape that ruin must go, come out of her, my people. And therefore, as certainly as we do, as we, to whom the message has been given, have in any care for the souls of men, any fear of God, or any love of the message, which Jesus Christ has given us, what is there alone for us to do but to tell the people what is going on, what Babylon has done to what she is doing, how, how ruin hangs right over her. Tell them the ruin is there. The second rumor has come. She is to sink, to rise no more, nor to be found anymore at all. But God does not want any man to sink with her. Um he would have every soul turn away from her and turn to him for the life and salvation there is in him. Therefore he calls, come out of her, my people, that ye receive not of her plagues. There is where we are. There is the rumor abroad. Oh, is it abroad? That is the question. Is it abroad? Have you been sounding it abroad? How long have we been in the time of the loud cry? More than two years. Have you been sounding that rumor these two years, brethren? Have you all been giving the message which has been given to you to sound, urging the people to escape from the ruin that is impending and that they must flee to God if they would escape the ruin? Well, then, shall we not go from this conference to sound that rumor with the loudest voice that God can give? Is there anything else to do? How can there be anything else to do? And of all things, how can there be anything else thought of by those to whom God has given the message? And upon whom he has laid the responsibility of sounding that rumor. Come out of her, my, my people. <clears throat> well, thanks everyone uh, for joining us in this study. But any final comments? I think it's pretty self-explanatory there at the end. We can see the parallel with his time because we are in the time 
of the Sunday law. And and the question and the question that comes to him, are we sounding that rumor? Are we calling people out of Babylon? Well, this is something that that we are working on. We are, in a sense, calling people out of Babylon. But this movement has not accomplished its task. So <clears throat> there's a lot more that could be one, said. And then it goes to another, and then it spreads to three, and then it spreads to six. Yes, yeah, continues now, on increasing. Yeah. Now, part of it is we need to understand what this message to come out of Babylon means. Right. So we're not going to go in the street and yell at people come out of Babylon. Right. We need to know what this message is. And we need, we need to be out of Babylon if we're going to call people out of Babylon. Now, one of the things so, I just comment on. I just can I ask you a question? Okay, but let me comment on this first. So one of the things that um, we need to recognize is that this issue about the Seventh-day Adventist Church being Babylon is kind of a um, something that deflects us away from the real issue. Because we know the Seventh-day Adventist is, church is not Babylon. But right. are, are Seventh-day Adventists in Babylon? That's a different issue, yes. right? So the call is to come out of Babylon. So we are in Babylon. Seventh-day Adventists are in Babylon. We're all in Babylon. And we need to come out of Babylon. There's no point of saying that the Adventist church is Babylon and call people out of the Adventist church. That wouldn't be calling people out of Babylon. Right? Because the Adventist church isn't Babylon. But it is in Babylon. So you had a question there. Yeah, well, you know, when, we did, when we've talked about Babylon, we've always talked about the Babylonian garments. Okay? And the Babylonian garments are the Character. The counterfeit of, I'm sorry? It's character. Garments. Hello? Yeah. That's right. The garments are character. And when we're talking about the character, we're not talking about the Babylonian character that we need to be going for. It's the Christ, the Christ character. Right. And so I see, when you say Babylon, I keep seeing character issues. That's Babylon. Right. So people... Yeah, so people think just because we know the Catholic Church is the Antichrist and we don't worship, you know, on Sunday, we worship on Sabbath, and, and we don't believe incorrectly about what happens when you die, we believe the truth, that somehow that means we're out of Babylon. But that doesn't mean we're out of Babylon. We're still in Babylon. So, so I get your point there. Okay, so we need to close with prayer. So let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the Sabbath that's coming. Thank you for each precious soul who has spent time uh, studying these things, uh, watching these videos or participating. And Lord, we, we ask that you can continue a work that you had begun, that you can complete it unto the day of Jesus Christ. We know, Lord, uh, we need you every hour, every moment not just to understand your word so that we can share it with others, so that we can be transformed, that our characters can be changed. We all recognize we are sinners. We don't see everything um, that has hindered our walk with you and, and, and the things that we have done that have hindered others. So we ask for forgiveness your power in our lives, and that you can give us clear discernment. Be with each person and bring us together again to study your word tomorrow morning. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.